Welcome Cogs. I have designed a brand new bionic hand from scratch, and this time my design has no servo surgery, no resin printing, minimal fasteners, printed parts and off the shelf components, yet I've still managed to cram in 11 degrees of freedom and kept the proportions very close to human sized. This time I can safely say that this is a robotic hand you can print at home. All the parts can fit on an A1 mini, the entire finger system prints in place as a ready to go system of linkages and there's no crazy soldering wizardry like in previous designs. In this video I'll show you how I designed it with the help of the new RevoPoint Pop3 Plus handheld 3D scanner. But first I wanted to take a little look back at some of my older designs. I first got interested in building a bionic hand when I was probably around 17. I can't remember exactly what set it off, but I've had a lifelong interest in the human body, and I think that the hand is, mechanically, probably the most complex and interesting part of it. I made a few different attempts before I started university out of wood, but unfortunately I don't have any pictures of those, but I would lump them together collectively as version alpha. Then during university I started a new 3D printed bionic hand which controlled each joint using a tendon system, by which I mean a motor inside the forearm pulled on a piece of string to effectively puppeteer the joints from a distance, allowing me to get a much more complex and dense design while keeping the power of larger motors. This version, version beta, had a spring in every joint and more fasteners than McMaster car, so it read too much and it really didn't move that well, but I did build and test a final version. I picked the project back up around 2020 and totally redesigned from scratch, with positional servos in the joints themselves, a much more lightweight design approach and more complex parts printed in resin. I designed and printed my own servos just to fit within the shape that I wanted, and I even had actuators for the metacarpal bones beneath the fingers, meaning the shape of the palm could change and subtly alter the orientation of the ring and little fingers. This design, version Gamma, was extremely cool, but I think it was just too ambitious for that stage in my life given my skill level and other commitments at the time, and so I never actually finished a full working prototype. I had a break between the end of 2020 and 2023, and then worked on it very on and off until I finally finished a working prototype at the start of 2024. Version Delta was heavily based on Gamma, but I stripped back a lot of the cooler, more ambitious features. I switched from my homemade palm servers to off-the-shelf ones, I made the palm static instead of actuated, and I simplified the thumbs motion too. The prototype worked, but at what cost? I couldn't shake the feeling that version Delta doesn't really achieve the requirements I set out, and the even worse problem was that my requirements actually aren't very clear at all. Back in 2020, when I still had a Yorkshire accent, I laid out all of my requirements in this video. The main thing that I stressed was that I wanted it to be affordable and easily accessible so that people could make their own. I would argue that version Delta is too hard to build. My new philosophy going forward is not to try and do everything at once. If my goal is for a design to be accessible to the general 3D printer owning public, then it should actually be easy to build and cheap. Whereas if I want a design to be highly biomimetic, tackling movements and ranges of motion not yet explored, then maybe that should be a separate design which might be a little bit more expensive and tricky to build. That brings us to version Epsilon. The number one requirement is that it's pretty easy to make, and the number two requirement is that it's not too expensive. In terms of mechanical function, the biggest obstacle to making any of my hands designs achievable for the average hobbyist is the massive amount of actuators, joints, servos, sensors and wires, so I decided to simplify the mechanical action of the fingers to be driven by only a single actuator. This will mean that there are some objects I can't grasp, but another requirement is that I still want Epsilon to be able to perform some different grip types, namely the six different types outlined in the Southampton hand assessment procedure. Finally, it needs to be shaped like a hand, by which I mean it should be roughly the same size and shape as a human hand, with similar relationships between finger lengths, etc. There's a lot of scientific data and research on this type of thing, but there are a lot of details that unfortunately just aren't mathematically defined yet. Until now, it's been pretty much just guesswork for me, but this time I used Riverpoint's new POP3 Plus 3D scanner, a handheld structured infrared light scanner that's designed for capturing medium to large sized objects like faces, engine parts, and in my case, my own hand. It's portable, easy to set up, and incredibly precise, 30% more so than Riverpoint's previous version, and perfect for creating a benchmark for improving the proportions and realism of my designs. The first step was to use these reflective stickers called global markers to create essentially anchors which help the scanner to keep track of the object as I moved around it. It was quick and easy to get going, I connected the scanner to my laptop, opened Revo Scan 5 and started scanning. The hardest part was probably just keeping my hand still as I moved around and scanned, 
but Riverpoint software makes it easy to ensure I had the right distance as I went along. There are lots of post-processing tools inside the software, so for my purposes I wanted a clean, low resolution but dimensionally accurate mesh, and I still needed to be able to pick out important details like where the knuckles and finger joints were. Importing into CAD, I could see for the first time how my design stacked up against real-world anatomy. Later, I'll show you how I use this scan as a basis for designing the palm of my newest Epsilon hand by referencing the orientation of spacing of the knuckles in this scan. The POP3 Plus saved me hours of manual measurements and gave me the confidence to refine my design with real data instead of guesswork. Big thank you to Riverpoint for providing me with this tool. So the design of the fingers is pretty heavily based around a research project called HRI Hand, which is an open source anthropomorphic robot hand system. There are other designs out there which use a similar linkage system, but I wanted to call out this one in particular because I really appreciate how they made everything open source and it's all online and easy to access. In the paper, Hyunjun Park and friends describe a system of linkages to drive three finger segments along a particular trajectory using only one mechanical input, i.e. motor, whereas all of my previous designs have used a separate motors for each joint along the finger. I wanted to build on their work in a few ways. Firstly, I wanted to make a parameterized CAD model so that I could generate different fingers in the hand at different lengths, and also to have a blueprint which I could use to make changes to the angles and proportions of the framework and see how those changes alter the trajectory of the resulting fingers. Finally, I wanted to design a finger which could be printed entirely in place and readily assembled, meaning it's ready to go straight off the print bed. I went through a lot of iterations to get a solid design on this one. Initially, I had all the segments sticking together and nothing was moving, so I made variables in my CAD model to test different gaps between adjacent segments and the conical pivot points. Side note, the reason that the pivots are cones is because it's really easy to 3D print the entire shape, including its overhangs. In some of my earlier designs, I still had overhangs which were over 45 degrees, which meant that I needed supports when I 3D printed it inside of the fingers that were really hard to remove, but eventually I found a configuration for all of the different segments, which meant that I needed no support at all on any parts of the finger, except for the pulley, which I have a little cutout for, and some parts which allow it to connect to the palm, which I can talk about later on. I spent a whole lot of trial and error tweaking variables to make this finger print well, but also to get a natural movement arc and to try and get a range of motion that will allow me to grasp well. I'm really happy with the result in its current state, but the two main issues I'm having is that one, the flexion arc is a little shallow, which is mostly a function of the palm design, which I'll come on to later, and while some of the segments are securely locked in place, some of the longer segments have some flex in them, and this can result in some of the pivots popping out of place when the finger grips too hard. It would be so easy to just put a screw here to lock everything in place, but I don't want to weigh it down, and it would also be so sad to add fasteners to an otherwise entirely fastenerless design. I'm curious to know if any of you guys have any ideas for a print-in-place locking pivot solution that doesn't add any extra width. So if you were following me when I made the Delta hand, you might remember that I was having a hard time supplying enough current to all 21 of my servos, and after blowing up a few PCBs, I just ended up limiting the voltage, which drastically reduced the speed and power of that prototype. This time, I used Easy EDA to design a dedicated power supply board. Obviously, I had an easier time since I only had about half the amount of servos, but I designed the board to handle upwards of 6 amps by having two separate voltage regulators, each supplying half of the motors with up to 3 amps total. I also designed the board to house a Raspberry Pi Pico. I was very fortunate to find this RP2040 Pico-like board by Susan Works in the open source hardware lab, with an MIT license meaning it's pretty much completely open source. I made some modifications so that I could use a simple USB-C port rather than the original PCB connector, and another cool thing about this design is that it makes use of JLC PCB's full colour silkscreen printing, which is something that I've yet to delve into really, but it means that you can print a lot more detailed and colour-coded information on your PCBs, and it means you can design all the details in a single PNG image. I'm a huge fan of JLC PCB for providing easy, affordable and reliable PCB and PCBA solutions, empowering hobbyists and professionals to develop their designs. Having this starting point for the Pico light board is really exciting to me because, as some of you might remember, I've been experimenting with trying to develop my own driver boards for my eye mechanisms with built-in microcontroller chips, i.e. it would be a complete and ready-to-go controller board without needing to plug in another board like an Arduino Nano, but so far I have not been successful. 
Having this open source design as a starting point to integrate into larger projects is really exciting for me. I'll be honest, I've not tested this design extensively yet. As you can imagine, the CAD design and physical prototyping portion of this project was by far the most time consuming part, but I have been using Thorny with Pico boards to start controlling simple actions in the fingers, although as you can see, I'm at a pretty early stage. What I can say for sure is that the boards that I ordered from JLC PCB are working great, and I'm certain that I'm onto a winner with this design. If you want to try ordering this board or one of your own designs, ordering from JLC PCB is super easy. All you need to do is upload your Gerber file to get an instant quote. It's also very affordable with 1 to 8 layer PCBs costing only $2 and reliable strict quality control on every process and a rapid turnaround of only 24 hours for PCBs. Don't miss JLC PCB's 6 layer PCB special, get $30 off with a coupon and enjoy top quality 6 layer PCBs for only $5. Plus 2U ENIG finish and no engineering fees for via in pad. Now the flexion of the fingers is driven by motors mounted in the forearm, same as with all my hand designs, but this time I wanted to make things easier and I'm using much thicker 1mm braided polyethylene cord and the same PTFE tubing as is used in 3D printers, in fact I actually just stole this from the spec that came with my Bamboo Lab P1S's. The purpose of this sheathing is to give the braided cord something to pull against, like a brake cable in a bike. Last time, the amount of effort I went to to find and spec this 1mm spring wire housing was probably one of the main blockers that meant I took so long to finish that project. The forearm this time is a really simple two parts with all of the servos clamped in between. The biggest reason that assembly was such a nightmare on my Delta hand design was that for each servo driving a finger, you needed to open up the casing, desolder the super tiny internal sensor, file off the part of the gear which restricts its movement to 180 degrees and then solder on a new cable to replace that internal sensor with sensors mounted in the finger joints. I think that this whole process was just too high a barrier to entry for anyone else to get started with this project, so this time there's none of that. It would be possible to use an unmodified servo without any sensors in the fingers, relying on the servo's internal angle sensor to guess the resultant position of the fingers, but think of how much stuff is in the way of that transfer of motion. There's the servo going to a pulley tied to a cord going through a tube, passing over a wrist and then into the joint of the fingers. There's just too many parts which can move and flex, and it would be really hard to keep things calibrated. So my approach this time is to infer the position of the fingers based on the position of the servos as I mentioned, but this time I have one simple homing switch that the fingers can move to when the hand is first powered on, so we can be absolutely certain of the relationship between the position of the fingers and the angle of the servos, even if we had to adjust the tension of the pulleys or the fingers got knocked out of calibration. This also allows me to have a pulley which can be tightened at any time without having to worry about how it might affect the calibration of the fingers positions. In the delta hand I had to pull through the cord while keeping a firm hand on the pulley, do a little loop and hope that this was all tight enough, but this time I can simply twist my pulley to tighten it up. I'd like to expand on this to have a self tightening pulley, but that's probably a job for next time. I haven't programmed the system for homing the fingers and keeping traffic of their positions yet, but it's already looking very promising. Although, as mentioned, I am limiting the functionality of the hand to make it more accessible, it was really important to me to keep the lateral motion of the MCP joints, which allows you to splay your fingers. One thing which I always notice in other robot hand designs is that the orientation of all these MPC joints, the ones at the bases of the fingers and how they form the palm. Understandably, a lot of designs are completely flat, but real hands not only have a slight inwards curve, but they're also flexible in the palm, which gives us even more dexterity. When I designed my palm and the orientation of all the motors which make it up, I wanted a more concrete reference point to go on to find these positions, and so I decided to use the Reverpoint POP3 Plus scanner to estimate these orientations in my own hand. The issue is that while there's plenty of scientific data about things like length of the finger segments and ratios between them, some things are really just hard to quantify, and so I used the 3D scanned mesh of my own hand as a guide for how I was going to place each motor and ultimately how the hand would look. I chose a slight heavier duty servo than the MG90S's which I used last time, although I should mention that I'm making this design configurable for different commonly available servos, and annoyingly this does make the palm a little bit thicker than my own. This is the whole reason I tried to design my own flatter servos in the Gamma Hand. I just didn't have the skill level at the time, but I definitely want to revisit that sometime. I also actually thought about the cable management system a little this time, which has always been one of my most neglected areas in previous versions. Luckily, it's going to be a lot simpler this time since there's far fewer cables and bowden tubes, but I made a few simple loops to guide everything to where they need to be. 
This is kind of inspired by the carpal tunnel in human hands. The bottom of the carpal bones make a sort of crescent moon shape and all of the important bits run through the tunnel. Even though this is pretty minimalistic at the moment, my plan is to test out this version for a while first, and then once I have a good idea of how everything moves, I'll probably make some more tight fitting guides later. So as I've switched to an RP2040 based control system, I think I'll be doing most of my programming in Python through Thorny. There are libraries which make it very easy to generate PWM signals to try with servos, so I don't think that will be a problem, the main control challenge will be how I keep track of the positions of the fingers relative to the home position, which is where the finger touches the homing switch. I think I'll need to have a counter for each finger that approximates angles based on the time that the servo is moving at a given speed. I believe I can also configure the homing switch pins on the Raspberry Pi Pico to be interrupt pins, which would mean the system can accurately re-home whenever the fingers naturally get to their endpoint. I also need to think about how I want to actually drive and test the hand. Last time I used a leap motion controller but had a lot of issues with lag. In my version beta designs I also had an accompanying control glove which was extremely temperamental at the time but also a really fun thing to design. I'm not sure if it would be practical but I am considering designing some kind of controller. Not quite a control glove but maybe some kind of an ergonomic system of joysticks. So although the hand kind of looks done, there's still loads to do. I mentioned a few things that I want to improve already, but besides those, I want this design to have some kind of grippy texture for the fingers, since that's something I've lacked in previous designs. It would be great if I could find some kind of flexible 3D printable grippy surface, but unfortunately I don't think that TPU or anything else that I've tried really has the grip that I need, and so I probably will need some kind of adhesive strip that I add on afterwards. Once I'm happy with the whole electronic system too, I will be able to combine Susan's open source Pico design with my power management circuit to have a single dedicated board for the whole project. I will be releasing all of these STLs for free when the design is finished, but if you want access to all of the CAD files for this design, including CAD for all of the projects I've built or are in progress on my channel, head over to my Patreon page where you can get access at any tier. That means you'll also be able to adjust the design using my different configurations and by adjusting the master sketch. As always, a massive thank you to my patrons, and I'll see you guys in the next video.